hands that shape the world. A bond broken forever. Will death redeem us? The complex father-son relationship between Jin Sakai and his uncle turned adopted father Lord Shimada is a strong theme within the story of Ghost of Tsushima. It's the very reason why Jin has so much trouble breaking his own moral code and finding the stomach to do whatever it takes to free the island of Tsushima, to break free from tradition, find new methods of fighting, implementing deception, fear, and novelty in order to rid the island he swore to protect from the death and destruction being wreaked by the Mongol invaders. I've already covered Jin's transformation in great detail from a fallen samurai to the legend of the ghost, along with Jin's father, the butcher of Iki Island. Jin's relationship turned bitter rivalry with his former companion companion Rizzo, and the importance of the Yarikawa Rebellion in a handful of other videos. So feel free to check those out if you like. But today I wanted to focus on the father-son relationship from the perspective of Lord Shimura, the honor and tradition Shimura felt compelled to abide by, honor and tradition that would cost him the future of his clan, a decision that would cost him the only family both a Jin and Shimura had left. Where Jin was flexible and arguably putting his people first, Shimada prioritized his honor, his duty to the Shogun, making sure everything he did was strict, rigid, and in accordance with his law. A law that we'll come to find is conveniently flexible when it best suited Shimada. A law that we will take a look at to get a better understanding of Shimada's mentality. How he ran the island of Tsushima, how he went into battle, and probably most importantly, how he shaped his nephew Jin to be his ideal successor to Clan Shimura. That is where we will begin. The relationship between Shimura and Jin was one of loss. Jin was taken under Shimura's wing after the death of his father on the island of Iki. Shimura promised to show the young boy how to be a proper samurai, how to be a pillar for the people, to honor his ancestors, all those that came before him to fight under the Sakai clan banner and how to become the most gifted swordsman the island will ever see. In the early hours of the game, we're exposed to how Shimura was able to do this, bringing his nephew up to speed on what it means to be a proper samurai. Shimura shared his core pillars of his code, honor, courage, loyalty, and tradition. When we dive deeper into these core pillars, Shimura mentions he's loyal to his shogun. He teaches Jin to control his emotions, never to strike out of fear or anger. Terror is not a weapon of the samurai, but of lesser people. In fact, it's the samurai's honor and duty to face their enemies head on, to fight showing respect for themselves and their opponents. They're to look them in the eye, grant them the last bit of respect before they leave this earth and strike them down swiftly. On a similar note, it's a high honor to die in battle to perish in the defense of one's clan, the people that they've sworn to protect, or possibly the highest honor of all, to die for the safety of the Shogun. These ideals are what would go on to shape Jin's perspective of honor and how to conduct himself on the battlefield. Keeping his emotions at bay was also something Jin was particularly scolded for by Shimura. <laughs> Traitor! You would stab the Chido in the back! Ozakai! Control yourself. As someone who had a deep regret for what he perceived as a part of his father's death and yearning to deliver the same honor and respect to Clan Sakai as those before him, Jid did his best to listen and keep control over his emotions. Over time, this bond between the two of them would grow into a father-son type of dynamic, in a mixture of his love affection and high respect for Shimura, and out of some shame and regret for the death of his father, Jin would eventually go on to not exactly denounce his clan, but instead would go on to don on the armor of Clan Shimura to fight under his uncle rather than lead ahead of his own clan. This is apparent by him making comments of saying he's not worthy of wearing his father's armor. He's not the man that his father was nor is he anywhere near the same caliber of warrior. This notion, this belief, is also reinforced by Jin wearing the same armor as his uncle the day the samurai went to face the Mongol invaders at Komodo Beach. 
only embracing his position as head of Clan Sakai after his uncle told him his past cannot hurt him. He needs to accept his spot as Clan Sakai's head and help lead the charge against the Mongols as a glorious samurai. Now, From Shimada's perspective, with all this love, training, investment, and overall effort in making Jin follow in his footsteps, Shimada's lack of children or to our knowledge, anyways, any potential love interest or possibility of actually having some type of official heir, Jin fittingly would be seen by Shimada as not only his only son, but the rightful heir to Clan Shimada, the man who will lead the island of Tsushima when the time for Shimada to step down comes. A decision that I'm sure doesn't come too easy, but would rightfully seem like the best choice for him. Possibly an extension of his love for Jin, but also feeling quite confident and secure that the island and Clan Shimada will be led appropriately under Jin's leadership, who is already practically being molded into the same person Shimada saw himself as. With their bond only continuing to grow, there was only one more step to take as far as Shimada saw it. The adoption of Jin was something Shimada wanted to make official with, with his request to the Shogun to allow such a thing to take place, which if approved would have turned Jin Sakai to Jin Shimada, the official heir to Shimada's throne. And we know that's how it would have happened from Shimada himself. Tell them you are Jin Shimura, loyal servant to the Shogun. My hair. Now I have no doubts that would have been the route these two took. I think the love and respect between these two was quite deep. Jen would have accepted being the official son to the man who took him in and taught him every single thing that he knew. Unfortunately for the both of them, the Mongol invasion would show just how different these two men can be. Most notably Shimada's unwavering commitment to his own code of honor. Now on some level I think there may have been another opportunity for the rift between these two to be salvaged. I believe if it wasn't for Jin witnessing the dirty tactics of the Mongols on Komodo Beach and him failing to save his uncle by attempting to free him by way of the samurai, constant failure in the face of a new different type of enemy along with the absence of Shimada's influence would definitely sway him into rethinking his definition of honor and who he was really duty bound to. Had Jin been granted the chance to be within Shimada's council, not left alone or even introduced to the ways of the thief by Yuna, he very well may have continued to be disillusioned by his uncle's beliefs, something he was still very much under the influence of at the start of the game. Jin spoke very highly of Shimura, initially believing once he was free from the Khan's captivity, the tide of war would change. His early infractions within his own law were justified as a very, very, very temporary means to free his uncle, who meanwhile heard of his nephew's exploits while jailed. The Khan was Shimada's only access to information regarding the war and the current state of Tsushima. Understandably, he refused to believe the Khan was telling the truth whenever he reported of his nephew's new and savory tactics. I'm told your nephew stalks my men, tears them apart like a beast. I'm certain you've done worse. <laughs> oh, you pretend we are different, but we fight for the same thing create a legacy that outlives us. I won my legacy with duty and honor, brought order to my home, and justice for my people. You are nothing like me. Neither is your nephew, but his name is bound to your legacy. But Shimida still gave some thought to it. When Jin does eventually free Shimura, he's quick to remind him of his sense of duty, telling him of the rumors that have been reaching him behind bars. And he's very stern to not succumb to the ways of the enemy, deploying fear or chaos is not their way. He still has a very strong sense of honor and now it's time to act in accordance of that. At around the same time, Shimura would learn of Jin's affiliation with Yuna, who is very clearly a sore in Shimada's eyes. She was not only a thief, but she hailed from the territory of Yarakawa, the region that some 15 to 20 years before rebelled against the rule of Shimada. It was a rebellion that was so horrible that to this day, there's deep-seated hatred on both sides. Shimada cares little for the people. That entire territory is completely exiled. As far as he's concerned, they don't exist. They're a group of assassins, thieves, lowlifes, and people ultimately unworthy of life. The people of Yadakawa see Shimura as nothing more than a tyrant full of hatred. Perhaps due to her Yadakawa heritage, her history as a thief, or her influence over Jin, 
Yuno would be the very person that would help destroy the image of Shimura that Jit has. Now, I don't mean to place the entire blame of the deterioration of the relationship between Jin and Shimura on the shoulders of Yuna. I think that would be quite ignorant. But I think it's important to point out just how convenient of a scapegoat she would turn out to be for Shimura, who would go on to make one final desperate attempt to reason with Jin and salvage their future as father and son. At around the same time, Shimura's flexibility is revealed in his own law in order to save his kinship and his future, his apparent lack of concern for lost lives in the name of honor, and him giving into his own emotions all happen at one crucial moment. And one fell swoop, the image these two warriors have of each other falls apart. And that moment comes when it's time to retake Castle Shimura from the Mongols. Leading up to the assault of liberation, Shimura's opinion of Yuna was increasingly obvious to be an unfavorable one. Shimura chastises Jin for being allied with such a degenerate, a thief that has no stake in their victory, a person who can't be trusted. Her concern is not with gaining total victory, she has no stake in their fight, rather she's only concerned with whatever she can gain from the opportunities that are arising out of this war. Shimura would go on to waste no opportunity to insult Yuna, either to her face or behind her back to Jin. Yarikawa has plenty of warriors, if their walls haven't fallen. I put down the Yarikawa Rebellion. Its people have no love for me. I know. I grew up there. Is that where you learned to steal? He lets Jin know that people such as this really cannot be trusted. Jin must affiliate with people who are respectable. While he's judging Jin's choices and allies, he would reveal too that he has friends or as he says unsavory allies in low places of his own, particularly Goro, a smuggler that Shimoda would instruct Jin to recruit to help infiltrate the Mongol blockade of the island of Tsushima. Now Goro and Shimoda's relationship, if we can even call it that, goes some time back, with it beginning when Goro was caught selling illegal Chinese silk. Instead of flogging him or imprisoning him in violation of Shogun decree, Shimura instead just burned his stock and let him go. His reasoning was, a skilled sailor is a valuable asset. Jin is able to see the wisdom here in Shimura's decision to keep Goro around, a decision that paid off very well in the middle of the Mongol invasion. Now, whether if they were aware of the Mongol invasion or not, I think it's kind of irrelevant. The fact was, Shimoda was able to see some wisdom in keeping someone around regardless of their position in life or exactly what they're doing to make ends meet. Conversely, he doesn't show the same wisdom with Yuna. Yuna shows her usefulness in granting some type of leverage with the people of Yadagawa. She and her brother Taka were fundamental in supplying Shimoda with an army of skilled swordsmen. Mind you, Clan Yadagawa was renowned for their gifted swordsmen. They were considered the best the island of Tsushima could offer. With the former clan of Yadagawa seething of hatred towards Shimura, he could never have gained any type of favor with them, especially without the help of Yuna. But he's skeptical of her ability to rally her former neighbors behind Shimura at best, and when she does eventually deliver, it's still dismissed with her only caring for one thing, whatever she can get out of the war, which is journeying to the mainland of Japan. Despite his skepticism, she did help deliver on bringing Yadagawa to the rallying cry of Tsushima. As ragtag Japanese forces fight the Mongol occupiers, Jin would deploy his tactics as the ghost not once, but twice. The first time even displaying a level of rage at his enemy that was repulsive to his uncle, decapitating a Mongol captain and throwing his severed head at his comrades. Shimura was quick to correct his nephew's deviation. Jin! What are you doing? Clearing the way. Not like that. Never like that. Face them as a warrior with honor. Monster. It's all they understand. Terror is not the weapon of a samurai. A few minutes later, as Shimura's forces breach the inner walls of the castle, the Mongol occupiers retreat deeper into it, with the access to the most inner sanctum only being reached by way of a single bridge. Shimura wasted no time in commanding his men forward to chase after the Mongol dogs and cut them down where they stood. This was despite both Yuna and Jin wary of some kind of trap. Jin exclaims something's wrong, there's no way the Mongols would give up so easily and as it turns out he was right. The Mongols sent horses armed with heavy explosives straight towards 
the Japanese forces, resulting in everyone on the bridge being killed. Losses Yuna and Jin both seen as unnecessary. Losses Shimona would appear to just dismiss as a result of being soldiers. It was their duty to die. Now they must be honored by having reinforcements repair the bridge and launch a secondary attack on the Mongol forces head on. An action in Jin's eyes that would only result in more men being pointlessly killed. If the relationship between the two is slowly fracturing, these last few minutes have been more and more nails in the coffin. Jin, in private, would offer to infiltrate the Mongols by himself, poison the enemy, and thus save more of their men from dying for no reason. Shimada points out that it's their honor and duty to die. He won't allow either one of them to teach the people of Tsushima to fear them by implementing tactics of fear and terror. He forbid the use of chaos or fear on even the Mongols, saying he taught Jin to fight with honor, which results in possibly the most badass line Jin says throughout the game. Honor died on the beach. The Khan deserves to suffer. You were ruled by your emotion. I sacrificed everything I knew to save our people. I gave them hope. You did nothing. In that moment, Jin was done. In that moment, Shimada gave into his emotions. The very thing that he tried so hard to make sure Jin would never do. Well, on some level, he's right. Throughout the game, Jin is slowly giving in more and more to his emotions. Him decapitating the Mongol captain was quite evident of that. But here, it was Shimada that was temperamental. Jin, in an act of defiance, would go on to disobey his uncle, infiltrate the Mongol camp, and poison the entire garrison in one quick move. Shimada would eventually breach the inner courtyard as the madness is continuing to unfold. Mongols crawling around the floor, groaning in agony. Others lay in pools of their own blood. A sight of pure horror for the man hellbent on honor. Hellbent on giving his enemies one final chance to die respectfully. To look them in the eyes and finish them with one clean blow. He condemns Jim's actions of poison and terror here, but he still gives him an offer. The Shogun would demand a head for his disobedience and terror on full display here. The head does not have to be Jin's though. Accept Shimura's offer of adoption. Become Jin Shimura, his proper heir. Renounce the ways of the ghost and possibly most importantly, blame Yuna for this outrage. Blame her for the ways of the ghost. This would be a death sentence for Yuna. The Shogun will demand a head. But it does not have to be yours. I know she drove you to this. Uncle. Renounce the ghost. You must blame her for this outrage. Tell them you are Jin Shimura, loyal servant to the Shogun. My heir. My son. I am not your son. I am the ghost. And you will be judged for it. It's quite shocking for Shimura to have such little concern for the fate of Yuna, should the ghost's actions be placed upon her. Jin undoubtedly did the right thing in doubling down on his resolve and claiming to be the ghost of Tsushima for all to see here. The ultimate act of defiance, he sacrificed his future and his family. Shimada crying as he burns the official approval for Jin's adoption is heartbreaking. It's not just disappointment of his former son betraying him, accepting ways that he was never taught or trained to be like, but it's the fundamental understanding that he will be punished for his crimes against the Shogun, for the crimes as the ghost. Crimes that they both are going to suffer for. Jin is taken into custody. He does eventually escape, but with the Shogun declaring him as an enemy of the state, his allies are now halved. He would have been actively hunted down by his former samurai companions had Shimura not deemed the Mongols a bigger threat than the ghost. The Shogun actually put Jin as a higher priority, but again having some amount of defiance in the face of the Shogun out of love for his nephew, Shimura opted to put the ghost behind the threat of the Mongols. Events leading up to Jin being enemy number one could very well have been seen as countless warnings by Shimada. Now on the other side of the Shogun's favor, Shimada would choose to stick 
to his shogun, to his honor, to his duty. Despite giving his outlaw nephew a few extra chances to correct his course, the end of these two's journey, so far anyways, is one of the most tear-jerking scenes in any form of media. Jin was officially the last of Clan Sakai. The minute he announced loud and proud that he was the ghost, Clan Sakai was no more. His family estate was taken, Shimada's request for adoption rescinded, and Jin was branded a traitor. While Shimada unveils this new information of demanding Jin's head, he begins to cry. He looks to Jin and tells him that he was his son. Now he has to continue Clan Shimada without him. You are my son. Now I must continue the line of Shimura without you. I must start a new family. And my head is the cost. Taking it is my punishment. The shaking in Shimura's voice, the urge to fight back the tears that are already flowing despite all the restraint. He won't look at his son. It's too painful. He tries to lighten the mood by saying their final day together is beautiful. Jin, after writing the final words of Clan Sakai, looks back at his adoptive father. Despite everything, it's still his father. He's grateful for everything that he taught him. The silent acceptance of Jin is almost as sad as Shimada's reaction, but Shimada's emotions are so overwhelming, it's contagious. This is their final chapter, it's their final time together. As they stand up, they unsheath their swords, and they draw closer to each other. One final duel, as they've done so many times before, with wooden makeshift swords. Only now, it's the end of their bond, as they know it. As of right now, there's no official canon ending to this game's story. There's two options, obviously. Players can choose to honor Shimada with a warrior's death. Upon Shimada's honorable end, Jin would then put the end to both Clan Shimada and Clan Sakai. Alternatively, players can choose to not kill Shimada, with Jin saying that he may not have honor, but he won't kill his family. He then puts on the mask of the ghost, embraces his new identity with Shimada's last words to his nephew being the ghost would be hunted for the rest of his days. I think regardless of your choice, whatever is going to be official or not, the sequel is definitely going to have a very interesting premise behind it, whether if Shimada or his replacement would have some interest in the ghost and how the ghost's journey and story would pan out. I think the devil ultimately here is in the details. Shimada saying that Jin was his son and the cost of him continuing his family lineage is the head of the person he spent so much time, effort, energy with. It's not exactly like he was a stranger, he still was his flesh and blood, but he raised him from such a young age. He trained him to yes, follow in his footsteps, which some people may frown upon, but he did it in a way where he wanted Jin to live a life that Shimada himself best knew how to live, to be honorable to value the same traditions and live respectably the same way that he did. And I think from a father's perspective, that's all you can really ask for. It's just a shame that he stuck so rigid to his code that he turned on his former son. He had some flexibility here and there, but maybe it was because Jin was so bold and blatant with certain actions in front of everybody that Shimana just could not shield and mask his son anymore. And it became a matter of being a traitor with the ghost, or continuing to lead your people the best way you know how. Shimada may not have been perfect, but in a way, he did the best that he could. 